Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Get out your King James Bibles. Today's study we're going to be talking about ye are they which justify yourselves before men. Okay, what does that mean? How important is repentance? Well, we're going to get into this. How important is repentance to God and how important should it be to you? Because you got a lot of people today, they have the attitude, they, ye are they which justify yourselves before men. They're using justification for salvation instead of repentance for salvation. And we're going to get into this. Turn to Luke 16, 15. Luke 16, 15. Let's just dive right on in. Duh. Luke 16, 15, we read, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the religious crowd. The number one people that I deal with that attack me hardcore in repentance is the organized religion crowd. The easy believism religious crowd. Okay? Not the lost people. Not the poor in spirit. Not the... Uh, publicans and sinners, okay? but the religious crowds are the ones that are attacking us. When it says, that ye are they that justify yourselves before men, we're going to find out these are the religious crowds that reject repentance. Let's keep reading here. But God knoweth your heart. Once again, it comes back to a heart issue, brothers says Christ. They always get on to us. Uh, I still, to this day, I'm still disappointed, but Peter Ruckman knows better. All I can do is correct Peter Ruckman and get brethren on the right path. But Peter Ruckman made an old study, and I, I, I love a lot of his teachings, but in one of his old studies, he started mar mocking. He was trying to talk about assurance of sal salvation, which is great. We need to have assurance of salvation. These things that I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know ye have eternal life. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed into the day of redemption. I always tell brethren, when you're newly saved, Satan will try to get you to doubt your salvation. He'll try to get you all messed up. His ministers will try to do it. At some point in your walk with the Lord, you're going to get that assurance of salvation, and you're going to be rock solid for the rest of your walk with the Lord. Absolutely. But in that study, he started mocking what the Bible talks about believing in your head or in your heart. The Bible talks about uh, they had the knowledge of, of Jesus Christ. The latter end is worse than the beginning. It's been better if they had not known the way of righteousness. The latter end is worse than the beginning. Why? Because they have the knowledge, and there's that saying, you miss heaven by 13 inches. You know what Jesus Christ did. You know why Jesus did it. You made a, a fake profession of, of faith just so you can be part of whatever clubhouse or group you want to be, social club, country club. You have the knowledge, but it never makes it down here. And what makes it down here? Repentance. And as we get into this, those Republic, uh, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, they were rejecting repentance. God knew their heart. It'd never make it down to their heart. Their heart was hardened. They had a prideful spirit. And they had hardened hearts. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but God knoweth your hearts. You're justifying yourself before men. The Bible says they go about to establish their own righteousness. You'll hear people say self-righteousness. I don't say that. Why? Because the Bible says you cannot have self-righteousness. It doesn't say chapter and verse where it says self-righteousness. It says you go about to establish your own righteousness. Ye, right here, ye are they which justify yourselves before men. They justify themselves. Well, I'm not that bad. Yeah, I sin, but I'm the religious crowd. I do my animal sacrifices, and that took my sins away, so now I'm sinless. You're the sinner. You see that with these uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes. We're not sinners. Why? Because, I mean, you, we did bad things, but I did my animal sacrifice. Now they're wiped now they're, they're white clean, and I'm sinless. You see movements like that today, where they try to promote sinless perfection. I'm still a sinner, but I'm a saved sinner. And the ultimate cost, the ultimate price of sin, Jesus paid for me. Okay? I'm not going to hell anymore. I'm going to heaven. I'm saved. I'm sealed. Okay. For God knoweth your hearts. 
For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Okay. Let's study today. Ye are they, ye are they which justify yourselves before men. What's going on here? What does this mean to justify yourself? When you have people, and I'm going to go into it a little bit, you have uh, easy believism. Faith alone. There's, it's, you're saved, it's faith alone. You're saved by your faith. They're trying to justify themselves with their head knowledge. They reject repentance as it applies to salvation, or they'll change the definition of repentance. It's no longer having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins, because it's personal. You come to the cross, throwing your iniquities for the cross. I'm a sinner. Not, we're all sinners. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. No, I'm a sinner. I'm the chiefest of sinners. Oh, wretched man that I am. You fall on your face. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We're going to get to that verse. God be merciful to me. You come to Him personally, and it's about your personal sins that put Jesus Christ on the cross. And they'll take that and say, that's not it at all. It's just going from unbelief to belief. I'm saved by my faith. Ye are, I'll read it again. Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. It says, for by grace are ye saved. Grace. It's God's grace that saves us. Repentance doesn't save us. It's just how we find God's grace. Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ doesn't save us. It's how we find God's grace through faith. Uh, confessing both in prayer doesn't save us. Asking God to save us doesn't save us. Who saves? God does. But when you got them cutting out repentance... Now they're trying to take out prayer, and it's faith alone. They're trying to justify themselves before men. Ah, I saved myself with my faith. And they get on to me because I say you turn faith into works. Faith isn't supposed to be works. It's supposed to be down here. But they've turned it into something that they're doing. Let's keep reading that verse. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, uh, 9, and 10. For by grace are you saved through faith. They used to say faith alone, and then we got onto them and says, uh, it says through grace we are saved. It's God's grace that saves. It's God that does the saving through His Son, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice of His Son on the cross. It's God that does the saving. Well, well um, grace alone through faith alone. No, it's one or the other. It's not both. They still keep trying to justify themselves by their faith. Okay? The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. The moment they say, my, I, I, my faith saved me, repentance saved me, my faith saved me, because it takes faith to repent, it takes faith to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, it takes faith to confess both in prayer, and it takes faith to ask God to save you. Not of yourselves. But they like to pervert that scripture. It's faith alone. Faith. No, it isn't. It's grace alone. It's God's grace that saves. And here's how to find God's grace. Through faith. Here's the steps. Repent. Repentance towards God. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer. And ask God to save you. That's how you find God's grace. Through faith. And not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. If it's something you did... To get saved, I did this and therefore I saved myself. It's not a gift. You earned it. You earned it with your faith. There's people that tell you you got to keep the Levitical laws. You get people that get into where you have to merit salvation and you've got to die in a state of grace. Uh, it's no longer a gift if you're earning it. It's just today the deception with this easy believism is the head knowledge and you've earned salvation with your head knowledge. And you can continue doing whatever you want because you earned your way to heaven. You earned the right to sin. You earned, it's all garbage. Just utter garbage. And I'm talking about the life they're living. They don't just come out and say it. But you look at the life they're living. They've earned the right to live however they want. Because of my faith. And they get so upset with me because I point them out and say this isn't right. This isn't right at all. Not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works. Now, the works part there is talking about the Levitical laws, trying to keep the Levitical laws in order to be saved. That's the works. Because they'll get on to you and say, well, breathing's working. When your heart's beating, it's working. When you're breathing, it's... And then they start getting to where prayer's a work. No, it isn't. 
Okay. When it talks about not of works, it's talking about keeping the Levitical laws in order to, to go to heaven. Okay. Prayer is not a work. Repentance is not a work. Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ isn't a work. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And this is what they hate pre preaching. They, they will preach Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and then yell, faith alone, faith alone. But they leave out verse 10. And they do it purposely. Why? Because it's the changed life. Remember, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. If you truly repented and believed in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you, and God looks at the heart. We just read here, God knoweth your hearts. He looks at the heart. He saves you. There's going to be a changed life. It's evidence that you repented and believed. No changed life, then you just have head belief. You just have head knowledge. Fake belief. You know, it talks about faith unfeigned in the Bible. Your faith can be faked. It's not real. It's just head knowledge. You don't really believe. Why? You skip repentance, you'll never truly believe. It'll never make it down here. It's supposed to be a heart issue. But verse 10 says, For we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. What's, what are the good works? This will define what the good works are. Pauline epistles. Instruction and righteousness all throughout the Bible. This, God's word, will define what the good works are, but unto good works. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. How you look at everything changes. Because you look at it through these glasses. Everything changes. To have before been ordained that we should walk in them. It's been ordained that when you get saved and born again, you're a new creature. You gave the old man to Jesus Christ at the cross. You threw the old man at the foot of the cross. He's crucified with Christ. God gives you the new man, the new birth. And the new man has these, these glasses on. The new man hides this in his heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. This is what they hide in their heart. They're looking for that blessed hope with the life they're living. They're becoming ambassadors for Jesus Christ, the ministry of reconciliation. Put therefore on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil and have him done all to stand. Their life changes physically, spiritually. Sanctification. Remember, uh, to be a Christian means to be in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? He's made unto us wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and a good understanding have all they that keep His commandments. Okay. Fearing God is the beginning of wisdom, and if you fear God, you're going to do what He tells you to do. That's the end of wisdom. Made us righteousness. Okay, We're ambassadors for Jesus Christ, the breastplate of righteousness. We're in the ministry of reconciliation. We're supposed to be a living witness as, as well as a verbal witness. Sanctification. Made unto us sanctification. God cleans up our life. Be ye holy as I am holy. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Uh, avoid fornication. Put no wickedness before thine eyes. Do not bear false witness. Love your brothers and sisters. Command after command after command to help sanctify our life and cleanse our life so we can be separate from this world and we can be a proper light to this dark world. Sanctification and redemption. What motivates us to do all the first three is we're looking for that blessed hope. We're looking for that blessed hope. Brothers and Christ, are you looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living? Or have you become like some of the brethren that are getting distracted by the world and they've turned their back? They, used to call, they call it the imminent return of Jesus Christ, but the Bible says looking for that blessed hope, present tense. Paul was looking for it in his lifetime. It didn't happen, but he was looking for it. And loving the, great, the, the, loving the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Loving His appearing. And you got brethren to get distracted by the world, and they're, now they're pushing, hunkering down, and, and, and surviving and enduring hard times, enduring to the end to be caught up, you know, type attitude. They turn their back on looking for that blessed hope. And they're hurting the brethren out there by getting you to turn your back on looking, present tense, for that blessed hope with the life you're living. No matter how bad it gets out there, our life, how we're supposed to live for Jesus Christ, doesn't change. The mission doesn't change. Okay. So I'll say again, Luke 16 15, Ye are they which justify yourself before men. Brethren, when you come across people that are attacking everything I just talked about, about true repentance, and how we're saved by God's grace, it's not 
we're not, it's not faith alone. We're saved by God's grace. How do you find God's grace? Well, through faith, absolutely. But we found out that's repentance that happens in the heart. There's belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ that happens in the heart. And there's confessing both to God in prayer and asking God to save you. There are steps that they'll take everything out. And then they make this, the belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ. When they come and attack this stuff, brothers and sisters Christ, you're dealing with people who are justifying themselves before men. Some of them try to justify themselves before God. We're going to get to that Pharisee and the Sadducee that went, or the Pharisee and the publican that went up in the temple to pray. One was justifying himself before God. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, that shall you also reap. People think they can deceive God. John, John 9 41, we read, Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. What's going on here? They justify themselves before men. They refuse to repent. They're justifying themselves before men. Job 9.20, this is Job. If I justify myself, if I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. In John, we read about a saved man. If a saved man says, I have no sin, he is a liar. We're going to get to that one, that verse. If, he says, if I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. That's Job. Same Job that... He started questioning God, why God's allowing all this to happen. He started questioning God, and when God called him out, he just said, I abhor myself in dust and ashes. I'm without excuse. I'll shut my mouth and, and say no more. If I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I'm perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. And of course, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Get your Bibles. Let's turn to. We're going to go through the whole chapter of verse 15. We're going to go back a chapter and we're going to go through this together. Okay. What's going on here? You have the. It says here the publicans and the sinners, they're repenting. And you look at their reaction to it. These Sadducees, these Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. And some people forget that that's what's being talked about here. These parables that God is talking about in verse 15 is to push the fact that their attitude towards repentance is wrong. These easy, believies, easy believism that is trying to get repentance out of salvation, how they treat you and their attitude towards uh, repentance as it applies to salvation is wrong. They're Pharisees, they're Sadducees, they're scribes. Let's go through this. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Okay. Verse 2. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Uh, you're sinners too. But they're distancing themselves. I'm not, I'm not sinners. I'm not like these people. I, I've done some bad things, but I did my animal sacrifice, and now it's been taken care of, and I'm sinless again. And they have this high mentality of justifying themselves. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Remember what the Bible says? They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In other words, he's called everybody to repentance. Because there is none righteous. We just read that verse. There's none righteous. No, not one. And he spake this parable unto them, saying... What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And here's the key. And when he hath found it, he layeth on his shoulder, rejoicing. He's rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. The key word there is rejoicing. Why? 
Verse 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine, ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. That parable is talking about a guy who lost something and then when he found it, he rejoices. And he comes and tells his friends and his friends are to rejoice with him. When someone truly repents and believes in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confess both in prayer and ask God to save them, when they repent as it applies to salvation here, we should be rejoicing with that person. There's people that have testimonies that when they got saved, they were excited, they were glad, and when they went to tell the people around them, the, t the people around them tried to steal their joy. Oh, you're part of an occult. Oh, they just start tearing you down. Oh, you're just mental. You're crazy. Oh, you repented. You didn't have to repent. That's a false gospel. You're still lost because you repented. And they start tearing you down. Where's the joy? How many of you have seen Sheffy? If you haven't, it's a good, it's a good movie, Christian movie, about the life of uh, Robert Sayers Sheffy. Okay. Some people argue it's not exactly like the book or not. I like the movie. And when the man gets saved and he goes back to tell his family, he didn't get the, instead of them rejoicing and praising God, you're saved, he got the, oh my gosh, how dare you talk like that in our house and everything. You got to watch it. They, turn, they, took, they tried to steal his joy. What Jesus is saying here with those Sadducees, Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, why aren't you rejoicing? Why are you trying to steal these people's joy? They've re they're, they're, they're repenting. They're coming to God as a sinner and having sorrow for that sin, and they're repenting. Why aren't you rejoicing? You should be. These easy believers of heretics, why aren't they rejoicing? They should be. Let's keep going. Over 99 just persons, real quick, over 99 just persons which need no repentance. They justify themselves. Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. This easy believism crowd that just, they've been indoctrinated and brainwashed into, it's just say a little prayer or no prayer, just believe in your head and continue living however you want to live and you got a free pass to heaven. They're being deceived. They're on their way to hell. They're going to wind up at the great white throne judgment. And they're going to be standing there saying, but I believed. God looks at the heart. We read that. The next page over. It said, God knoweth their hearts. Luke 16, 15 that we read. God knoweth their hearts. He says, depart from me, ye accursed, and everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I never knew you. Why? Because you didn't rejoice. You didn't repent and rejoice over repentance. You avoided it. You avoided it with every step of the way. You tried to find the back door into heaven. Rejecting repentance. Let's keep going. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently to find it till she find it. And when she had found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me. Rejoice with me. For I have found the peace which I had lost. People think these parables is talking about something that's lost and is found. It is. But the main point that Jesus is making here is when they found what was lost, what is the reaction? Rejoice with me. For I have found the peace which I have lost. Jesus says, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Joy in heaven. Oh, remember what he said before, over 99 just persons who need no repentance, they justify themselves. I, it's just faith alone, and I save myself by my faith. Well, I did the, like these paid Catholicism. I do the Eucharist, and I do so many Hail Marys, and and what not. They're justifying themselves. They need to repent. And when someone repents, our, those who are truly saved and born again, our reaction is, is we rejoice. False converts, 
They don't rejoice. They try to do away with repentance. And he said, and you guys know this, we talked about this in a recent study, and he said, a certain man had two sons. He does another parable, a long one, and we're going to read it. And yes, I, I, we did a study, and there's nothing to talk about. We did a study about beginning and end. Anything that has a beginning has an end. And we talk about how the beginning he was lost, and at the end he was found. Yes, that's here. But I almost missed the key point, and that's what we're talking about today. The whole key point of this is, joy, is rejoicing. When someone repents and goes from being lost to being found when they repent. Why aren't we rejoicing? And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me thy portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided them to his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with righteous living. Once again, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, Job, I, if I justify, my, justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, I shall also prove me perverse. Wasted his substance with righteous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land. You know, God, sometimes, God has to do something to break brethren, to, to break us, to get us saved. Sometimes after we're saved, when our heart starts getting hardened, God has to do something to put us back in our place, to break us. A mighty famine in the land. Now this is another, I, I know I say this, I'm not trying to beat on Peter Ruckman, but Peter Ruckman made a comment, because he's a gardener, I'm learning to garden. Yes, how I garden, I till the ground, and then I, I make holes and put seeds in there. But when you read the story, the parable of the sower, there is no tearing of the ground, he's casting the seeds. And wherever they lie, they lie. And I believe... Where I disagree with him, he says you got to tear up the ground. Like when we go to preach the gospel, we got to tear up the ground. You know, sometimes you can get into bullying people to try to accept the gospel, uh, bribing people to accept the gospel, guilt tripping people to accept the gospel. No, we just preach the gospel. We preach against sin and wickedness. We preach the truth. God does the tilling. God does the breaking of the ground so that seed can take hold. God brings people to their knees. He sent a famine in the land. And he began to be in want. He starts realizing something's not right with me. I'm missing something. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the field to feed swine. And he would have fain have filled his belly with his husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, how many higher servants of my father have bread enough and to spare it, and I perish with hunger? Those Bible-believing, God-fearing men over there, they have something I want. I'm perishing. I'm, 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 uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus the Lord. The wages of sin is death. That's what I have. But that person over there, the gift, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That true, Bible-believing, God-fearing man, the actual Christian man and Christian woman, I perish with hunger. They have something I want. I will rise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. No, 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 he's just supposed to be hard-hearted and just believe, only believe, only believe, all things are possible. I will arise and go to my father. God saveth such that are uh, the uh, God is near unto them of a broken heart, and saveth such that they be of a contrite spirit. Repentance. This this man is repenting. Remember the whole context of this whole chapter. He's hammering the Pharisees and Sadducees because they need they justify themselves before men and they need no repentance. Let's keep going. This man is repenting. And I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Talk about it. God be merciful to me, a sinner. I am the chiefest of sinners. O oh, wretched man that I am. I'm no longer worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of these hired servants, of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. 
And his son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. It's just not something he said in his heart. He actually told. Repentance happens in the heart. Then confession is made unto salvation. He told his father. And the son said unto his father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Now what's his father's reaction to his repentance? But the father said to his servant, Bring forth the best robes and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry, rejoicing. Now, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. He repented. He was lost. He repented and became found. And they were rejoicing. He repented. He came home. He's found again. He was lost. Now he's found. And they're rejoicing. Now, who is this elder? We, a lot of people have all these different ideas of who this eldest son represents. This elder son represents those Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. The elder son should have been like, he repented, he's home again, praise God, and he should have gone in there and started rejoicing with them. Did he do that? No. Verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what this things, these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. Well, praise God! I want to go in and see, I haven't seen my brother in forever. I want to go in and see my brother. Praise God! Rejoice! Is that his response? No. What's his response? And he was angry and would not go in. Verse 2. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. They're angry at Jesus Christ. They're angry at the people for repenting. They're angry at Jesus Christ for preaching repentance. Brothers says Christ, you stick to the true plan of salvation in the King James Bible, people are going to get angry with you. We talked about this in another study. When I preached the gospel, the true plan of salvation to the easy believism people, they get angry. They get bitter. They get angry. They get hateful. They get vengeful. They first start out with, oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm one of you and everything. And I call them out, you're not one of us. You didn't repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. You conform to the world. You love the world. You're a friend of the world. They are of the world and, the, and speak they of the world and the world heareth them. Their demeanor changes. I've had people tell me that I'm lost I'm a heretic, I'm on my way to hell, and I keep pleading with them with the truth. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, I keep pleading with them with the truth. You need to get saved. You're not saved. When you do it to them, they turn on you. You know, one minute the, the people are saying, Hosanna in the highest to Jesus Christ. The next minute when you, when you, you tell them, hey, you're not saved, they're crucify him, crucify him. They switch like that. And he was angry. He wasn't rejoicing. He was angry. That's the whole point of this parable. Those Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes, instead of rejoicing that the Christ, the Son of the living God, their king, Christ is king of the Jews, okay? Christ isn't king of the body of Christ. When you just say Christ, it's Christ when it's by itself is king of the Jews. Their king was there. He's preaching them salvation, the kingdom of heaven. Repent. And they were angry. The son is angry. The brother is angry. And would not go in. Would not rejoice with them. Therefore came out his father out to entreat him. Jesus is there preaching to the Pharisees as much as he's preaching to these lost people. He preached more to the publicans and sinners because they would actually listen. But he still preached to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and scribes. This parable is preaching to them. Brother says Christ, little side note. 
don't fall for the part where, oh, Jesus was sarcastic. Oh, Jesus mocked. He's not mocking. He's preaching to them, trying to open their eyes. And some Pharisees did get their eyes opened. But very few, if any. But he's preached to them. He's this father that came out to him, and he's preaching to them. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answered, said to his father, Lo, these many years I do serve thee. Here's the justification. Ye are they, me, ye are, ye are they which justify yourselves before men. Lo, all these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I at any time thy commandments. We are Moses' disciples. Remember the Pharisees when they called call, 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 will ye be his disciples? Talking about Jesus Christ. We are not his disciples. We, you're his disciple. Uh, we are Moses' disciples. We keep the commandments. Any time thy transgress, I any time thy commandments, and yet thou never gave me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, I'm not like other men are. Murderers, thieves, or this publican. As soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fat calf. He's repented. He's come home to be just a servant. He doesn't want anything. He's, he says that. I'm no longer worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. But he's not rejoicing in his repentance. That he's learned from that. That he's come home again. But as soon as this thy son was come, which had devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. How did he know his story? I know it doesn't go in hardcore, but he knew his, his, his brother took, went off and he came back home. And, it, and the, the, the servant just told him he's coming home again. It doesn't say it because it's a parable. But somehow he had to ask, you know, what, what happened? How did he come home? Where did he come home from for him to make those comments? And he said unto him, Son, this is the father, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry, rejoicing. Why? Because that son repented. That we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. How important is repentance to God? The Bible says God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Period. Repentance has always been there in every dispensation when it comes to finding God's grace. When it, came, when it comes to getting saved. Luke 15, 7. I'm going to read it again. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. How does God feel about repentance? He rejoices. It's important. It's necessary. It's required. Luke 15.10 Likewise I say unto you there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. One sinner. That's what these parables are about. Let's get to Luke 18. Turn to Luke 18. Let's go over to 18. He's dealing with these Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, and we're having to deal with them today, brothers and sisters Christ. They take repentance out. And we're fighting and doing damage control, trying to preach the true plan of salvation, and they're cutting it up. Doing away with repentance, doing away with prayer. And they're cutting up the God, and we're trying to damage control, and we're trying to preach the truth. That's what Jesus is doing with them. He's preaching to them. He's not mocking them. He's not being sarcastic. He's preaching to them. But he does it in parables. Luke 18, 9. Luke 18, 9. And he spake this parable unto a certain which trusted in themselves. I am saved by faith alone. I'm, I'm being saved by doing all this junk, the Catholic Church. By keeping their Levitical laws. We talked about this where the Old Test, uh, when Paul first, in the Pauline epistles, he's dealing with Jews coming in. 
and messing up the, the brethren and trying to get them back under the Old Testament Levitical laws in order to be saved. Circumcision, uh, keeping the holy days, Sabbath days, and new moon. Uh, touch not, taste not, eat not. All right? Well, today the Catholic Church has its own Levitical laws. You've got the Eucharist, you've got to say the Hail Marys, you've got to give... Uh, you have to go and give confessions every week, and you have to actually confess your sins. No, the Bible says we're to confess our faults one to another. You confess your sins privately one-on-one -on -one between you and God. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. One name given under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, and that name is Jesus. You go through Jesus Christ and confess your sins to God the Father through Jesus Christ, the Son. But you have certain men that trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Would we read up there in Luke 16, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men? Today, brothers and sisters Christ, you have men that in ministry, which I believe are saved, that they get really puffed up with themselves. When the Bible says that uh, they think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. They start becoming prideful. Okay, they have their, their egos are swelling. And they start having this attitude of trusting in themselves. And they have a hard time being accountable to the brethren. And they have the hardest time repenting. They have the hardest time repenting. Pray for them. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Witness to them. Plead with them. The way Jesus is pleading with these parables, he's preaching to these Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. Their heart is hardened. They have a prideful spirit, but he's still preaching to them. They trust in that they were righteous and despised others. Okay? Those who need repentance, they've despised them. When if they ever actually looked in the mirror, they realized, hey, that man right there in the mirror, he needs repentance too. We all do. Verse 10, two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood praying thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. He's justifying himself. Okay. Well, I'm not as bad as this person is. Yeah, I might sin, but I'm not as bad as this person is. And then they turn around and they start justifying themselves. How good they are. Verse 13. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. There's none righteous, no, not one. But they thought, they, they, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They trusted in themselves. Verse 13, and, the, and Jesus is there telling, showing them that uh, you're not righteous. There is none righteous. Verse 13, and the publicans standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. Tries to justify themselves. Go about to status their own righteousness. They're avoiding repentance at any cost. They're doing everything they can to avoid repentance. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Humble himself. Repentance. God is nigh unto them of, the, of a broken heart, and save as such that be of a contrite spirit. Psalms 34, 18 we read, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save as such that be of a contrite spirit. The sacrifices... I've accidentally put both verses at the same, but also in Psalms there's a verse that talks about the sacrifices of the Lord are, of a, are a broken heart and a contrite spirit. You have to come to Him broken. And you throw the old man at the foot of the cross. The old man is crucified with Christ. He's sacrificed with Christ. And as Jesus was dead and buried, the old man is dead and buried, 
as Jesus was raised up from the dead, we also should walk in newness of life. He's given us the new birth, a new life. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, I've said this before, the book of Romans, you can find things in the book of Romans that you'll find in Corinthians. Like this one, I believe, lines up with Corinthians. They're very wicked and sinful. And he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. There's a new birth. If any man be in Christ, that's in Corinthians. If. I don't know if you're all saved. I don't believe you're all saved. I don't think it, some of you have it up here, and it's not down here. If any man be in Christ, if a man be called a brother. Hey, 1 Corinthians 15, let me just preach the gospel to you. How that Christ died for our sin. He's preaching to save professing sinners. Not save sinners, but professing Christians. How that Jesus died for our sins. Repentance. According to the scriptures, and was bur buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You're supposed to be a living sacrifice. Fruits meet for repentance. Romans 6.1 What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? This easy believism believes yes, we should. We, we've earned salvation. They've skipped repentance. They've avoided it at any cost. Including the wages of sin is death. Even if it costs you death. The law of sin and death. Even if it means going to hell and, and burning for all eternity. They'll do anything they can to avoid repentance. True biblical repentance. Shall we continue that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? You come to the cross in repentance, throwing the old man at the foot of the cross. That wicked, dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner. And having sorrow for sinning against God. And you throw him at the foot of the cross. You throw your iniquities at the foot of the cross. I didn't say you clean up your life. That'll come afterwards. When God saves you, He will clean up your life. You start taking His word, you hide it in your heart, and He'll clean up your life. There's going to be a changed life. It's guaranteed for those who truly get saved and born again because you repented. Throwing your iniquities at the foot of the cross is saying, hey, look how bad I am. Look at my personal sins. These are my sins, and this is how bad and wicked I am, and this is how desperately I need to get saved. I'm on my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell. We are baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him, by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. Remember Ephesians 2.10? We read 8 and 9, but 2.10. For we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works that have before been ordained, that we should walk in them. We should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Jesus said, be holy for I am holy. You're going to have a changed life. You're going to be set apart from this world. To be a light to this dark world. God's going to clean up your life. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Am I still a sinner? Yes, I am a saved sinner. And the difference was, is my old man, he was a was a worse sinner than I am, my old man was, and he was a servant of sin. When God saved me, he broke the chains. I'm no longer the servant of sin. Do I still fail him sometimes? Yes. Do I still struggle with this wicked body of flesh? Yes. But I'm not the servant of sin anymore. I serve my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and I hide his word in my heart. And I live for him the best I can every day. And when I fail, Jesus talks about it, if any man come after me, he must deny himself. If, when I fail him and I do sin, the Bible says if we confess our sins, it's for saved sinners. If we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we sin and fail the Lord, we need to deny ourselves. We need to come back into repentance. It starts at salvation, 
getting saved, we need repentance to get saved, and that repentance stays with us our whole walk with the Lord until He catches us up in, in death or in life. We need to deny ourselves. Pick up our cross daily. When we sinned, we dropped our cross. We need to pick it back up. We need to get back. We need to turn from that wicked sin and get it back out of our life. It got back in. Get it back out of your life and get back. And it says, and, and, and follow me. We need to get back to our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and living for Him. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. In other words, we're not carnally minded walking after the flesh anymore. Romans chapter 8. We're not carnally minded. That's a lost person. Can you believe that there's people today trying to defend that there's that that's a saved person? That's two types of saved people. No, it's a lost person and a saved person. A lost person is carnally minded, walking after the flesh. Just as we read there, they are a servant of sin. They are a servant of the flesh. And when you get saved, you become capital S spiritually minded and you walk after the Spirit. He comes in and brings you into all truth. He teaches us how to take the, God's Word, hide it in our heart, and live it. We're not carnally minded walking after the flesh anymore. The average professing Christian in the world today, you look at them, they're carnally minded walking after the flesh. They're a servant of sin. They look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world. They speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. What's going on there? I can guarantee you, nine out of ten times, they skipped repentance. They were deceived in the not repenting and believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. They were told that repentance isn't part of salvation, ignore it, and they just head belief. They just have the knowledge of what Jesus Christ did and why he did it. But they ain't saved. Mark 2.17 When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, All these people that say, Oh, oh, repentance isn't part of salvation. Repentance is a work. Oh, repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. They're trying to do away with repentance. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them. Now, in context, he's talking about the Sadducees, the scribes, the Pharisees. The ones that are trying to avoid repentance at any cost. But if it was for today, he'd be yelling at all these easy believism heretics. When he heard it, he said to them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Sinners. Not, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're all sinners. No, you come to Him, you, personally. Come to God as a sinner. Throwing your iniquities at the foot of the cross, showing just how bad of a sinner you are. So Paul did. That's why he says he's the chiefest of sinners, because once he started pouring his iniquities at the foot of the cross, when he thought, well, yeah, I'm a sinner, but I can't, I can't really be that bad, and you're pouring your iniquity, wow, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Wow, oh, wretched man that I am. I'm a million times worse than I thought I was. I've experienced that. Brother, says Christ, if you're truly saved and born again, you experienced that when you came to the, came to the cross. Broken, Lord, I'm horrible. I abhor myself. Remember Job, I abhor myself in dust and ashes. I abhor myself. They that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7, 9. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry. I rejoice. How many of us, we read that and and kind of passed over it. After this study, Brother Chris, Sister Christ, when you see that now on 2 Corinthians 7, 9, now I rejoice. Does that word rejoice really hit harder? Hit home harder? Or does it rejoice when someone repents? He's rejoicing. Not that you were made sorry, worldly sorrow, sorrow, but that you sorrowed uh, sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner. You went to God with your sorrow. You threw your iniquities at the foot of the cross. You threw that old man at the foot of the cross. 
You are sorry after a godly man that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Verse 10, for godly sorrow worketh repentance. Godly sorrow makes repentance worth work. Worldly sorrow, never work. That's not, that repentance, never work. It's godly sorrow that worketh repentance to salvation. God, finding God's saving grace. Finding God's grace. Through faith. It takes faith to repent. It takes a lot of faith in humbling yourself to come to the cross broken, cross broken and throwing who you really are at the foot of the cross. That dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner. On your way to hell and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against you, Lord. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrows of the world worketh death. The wages of sin is death. The worldly sorrow, the wages of sin is death. Godly sorrow, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. What Jesus did for you on the cross, you should have had to go through that, but Jesus did he paid for my sins. The blood that was shed was God's blood. And it washed my sins away. And now I belong to Him. The Bible says, Feed the church of God which He had purchased with His own blood. Purchased. The Bible says, when Paul's getting on people that are starting to get into wickedness and sin and worldliness and starting to stray from God's Word and living a life of Christ, he reminds them that you're bought with a price. You're not your own. I belong to Him. The world worketh death. 11. For behold, the selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. Acts 20, 21, testify both to the Jews and also to the Greek, repentance towards God and faith to our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, they, they say, Romans road to hell, Romans road to hell. Then you quote true repentance in Corinthians. Oh, uh, Corinthians road to hell. They can't do that because if they start saying every book in the Bible where it's pushing repentance for us today, they'll have to keep saying it's all books to, that'll lead you to hell. They're doing everything they can. They're those Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes we read about. They get angry. They get hateful. They get bitter when it comes to repentance. Testify both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll go over it again in Luke 15, 7 and 10. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven. What did we read up there in 2 Corinthians 7, 9? 9? When people are repenting and believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and Confessing both in prayer and asking God to save you when people are getting saved. He says, now I rejoice. Why aren't these easy believers and people rejoicing with us? Why are they attacking us on true biblical plan of salvation? Because you are of your father the devil. And the lusts of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning and the father of it. They don't want the truth. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine just persons that need no repentance. Likewise I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Brother and sister Christ, don't let the enemy take the joy that shall be in heaven away from you. And don't let him steal your joy that you have over people that repent and get saved, truly saved and born again. Romans 5.11 we read, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. They're trying to steal your joy. Whom by we have now received the atonement. Romans 15.13 Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Repent. Repentance leads to belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. 
Justifying yourself leads to head knowledge. Don't let them steal your joy, brother, says Christ. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, and it keeps going. But one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy, and they're going to try to steal that from you. They're going to try to take that away from you. And the number one way they do it is they try to tell you that repentance isn't part of salvation. And they try to tear you down. And they're trying to steal your rejoicing, your joy. 1 Thessalonians 1 6. And ye became followers of us and of our Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Okay? If you suffer with him, you shall also reign with him. We're going to be taking much affliction. Now, if you've made it through this study and you've made it this far as one of the easy believism, my thing for you is it's not too late. To the brothers and sisters in Christ, don't let people steal your joy. Stand firm for the Word of God and keep preaching repentance. Don't give up on it. Those that were deceived by easy believism. Oh, repentance isn't part of salvation. Repentance isn't part of salvation. It's not too late. Repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross today, right now. Pause this video, get on your knees, and repent. And let that head knowledge become belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And God will look at your heart. And God will save you. You come to Him true biblical repentance, He will save you. And He'll give you the new life, the new birth. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Time is running out. Get saved today if you're not saved. And like false convert, you were deceived. Get saved today before it's too late. And brothers and sisters of Christ, keep standing for repentance. I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What he did for us on the cross. There's no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Talk about Jesus. He gave his life for us. Did you give your life to him at the cross? Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.